Is there any defensive lineman that was the toughest guy to go up against, either a star or even a lesser-known guy that maybe gave you some trouble? Who would it be and why? Man, there were a number of guys who were who were good players that I played against. Uh, some of them very high-profile, some of them not. Uh, one name that comes to mind, Kyle Williams. Mm. Uh, his defensive tackle from Buffalo Bills. That guy was a uh, – he's one of the highest motor guys I've ever played against. Good guy, good player, powerful guy. Uh, didn't – you know, and he was part of that – he was part of the – he was part of the Buffalo Bills era right as they were becoming a more consistent team, a better team. Uh, but he, he he was a guy who I had to play against numerous times. Uh, Albert Hainsworth in his, in his Tennessee days. Yeah was a guy I had to play against multiple times. Um, uh, what's his name from uh, Cincinnati? The defensive tackle. Geno Atkins. Was there for you. Geno Atkins. Geno Atkins was the best defensive defensive lineman I played against my entire time. Like wow. as far as, as far as this guy has, the, he's a complete package as a, as a DT. He's almost a defensive end. Uh, he's kind of a, a tweener in that regard, but, that guy was the most – I had to play the entire play, every play against him. And that was – that's hard. That's a hard thing to do, you know. But you, you're in the middle of the, line, the middle of the line. You have to be able to be able to keep that guy from penetrating into the backfield. Um, but he was probably, to me, the best – from a, from a skill set standpoint, he was the best defense tackle I played against in my, you know, in my career. But there were other guys who were good, good as well. Um just thinking off the top of my head here, uh, Pecco. Me, I used to but Pecco from Cincinnati. He was, oh, yeah, he was decent yeah. as well. Paul Solii was was a pretty decent player in Miami. Played against him a lot. Uh, let me see who else. Uh, Matt, uh, what was his name? Max from Miami's defensive tackle. Uh, he was there forever. Randy Starks. Um, was it yes. Randy Starks? Yeah. Yeah, that's a cat that me and him used to have battles back and forth. Uh, who else? I thought that ben, uh, Bennett from um, Seattle. Mm -hmm. I didn't think he was very good. <laughs> I, mean, I, I thought he talked a lot of shit. But he, wasn't really <laughs> he, he had a he had a mouth on him because he didn't like getting blocked. And I in the first game, first play of the game, I I chucked him into his outside linebacker because he thought he was in a. He thought he was gonna out. He was gonna run right past me, and I was just like, "Okay, yeah, that's not gonna happen." <laughs> was that the game in 2013? Um, you guys won against Seattle that year, or was that that game? Uh, I think it was a year before that because okay. he was. I don't think he was. He was a year or two before that. He wasn't. He wasn't in. I think he was gone by 2013 okay. to to another squad. But um, I didn't like him anyways. I thought he was just bad sport. Um. Who else? Uh, Charles uh, or Char Charles Rogers, the defensive tackle from mm -hmm. Cleveland, mm -hmm. big boy. He was he was a. I only played against him like twice, but that dude was a problem. I was like, yo, this dude is too <laughs> athletic being this big. He might have been. How are you this shifty? He might have been the best uh, nose tackle in the league when he was in Detroit. So he, he was. Yeah, he was one of the best. Uh, uh, you know, when we played him, he he was in Cleveland. He was, I mean, he was in his prime. I don't know what, how, you know, he was a guy that I think maybe a couple years later, he kind of like fell off, but that guy was, he was giving us problems. I was <laughs> like, yo, this guy's good. <laughs> but um, who else was, uh, another guy I didn't think was very good at all. Uh, Dominica Sue played against him. I thought wow. he was, I didn't think he was very good at all. I thought he was just Overrated. all brute force, nothing. <laughs> Completely overrated. He didn't do it. He had his worst game of his of his season against me. He had no <laughs> tackles, no pressures. Uh, I think he had like one hit, but it was like you know, it's one of those you know, you just kind of fall into the QB after you already threw it. What do these guys say um, at the line of scrimmage? Who who taught? Who spoke a lot of crap at the line of scrimmage? I, I know there's so many people. We've interviewed so many people over the last couple of years, ex NFL players, and if I I've asked them silly questions about. You know, what these guys say on the field and, and who was the biggest talkers on the field? Could you name some players that were just – just they opened up their mouth every uh, time they stepped at the line? 
what was that one cat's uh this cat played he was the line he was uh he was the Pittsburgh Steelers linebacker then he went to play in Miami I forget his name mm-hmm. uh Pittsburgh Steelers linebacker uh, he went Joey Porter to Joey Miami. Porter Joey Porter Ooh, Joey Porter talked that shit now <laughs> he talked a lot of trash I'm sure he did and he talked trash when we played him in Pittsburgh. He talked trash when we played him in Miami. But he was a good sport, though. Uh, he wasn't, you know, it was like he's doing it out of, like, his competitive nature, but he's but he's having fun. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, really, honestly, man, on the O-line, man, not a, real, not a lot of trash talkers. I, I never really dealt with a lot of trash talkers. Guys didn't usually say too much to me. Mm. Um I mean, I consider it out of respect because I mean, one, I hey, I ain't got the energy to go back and forth with you, <laughs> yapping. I'll, I'll go back and forth with you on some blocking, but not yapping because I'll be I'm too tired for that. Uh, but you know, it didn't really have to deal with a ton of that. Not not a lot of that, you know, as a, as, as a player. But we we are Joey talking. Porter's a guy who sticks out. Thirty eight year old, still young guy, Uche Waniri. Uh, has his whole life in front of him. Why don't we get into your career with the Jaguars? And you played with some decent quarterbacks. I mean, David Garrard was a pretty good quarterback in 2007. You were 11-5 and five in your rookie season. Uh, he's a good quarterback. And and Byron Leftwich, who, who was always a known quarterback in the NFL, uh, he had a pretty good career. Uh, he started his career with the Jaguars, almost got the head coaching job for the Jaguars this offseason, decided yeah. not to take it. He went back to uh, the Buccaneers. Did you ever think that Byron Leftwich was going to be a good coach or offensive coordinator when he decided to leave football as as, uh, as a starting quarterback in the NFL? I didn't get a lot of time with Byron, but mm-hmm. I did kind of figure him to be a coaching type. Uh, just, you know, seeing how his career played out in Pittsburgh. You know, he was a backup the majority of the time there, but Usually guys in his position have so much, such a wealth of knowledge mm-hmm. that coaching is almost second nature for them at that point. And that's kind of what they've start doing in their last few years in the league. And that's kind of where he was uh, as a, as a, as a player going into transitioning into being a coach. I'm not surprised in how his career has played, has mm-hmm. played out. You know, he's got a championship in Tampa Bay with the Bucks. you know, obviously have a Tom Brady <laughs> helps a lot, yes, it does. <laughs> but it does. Um, please don't remind me. No, I, I, I yeah, come on, man. Who I'm kidding? a, I'm a Jet fan, <laughs> so I, I had to deal with that my whole I've life. I had to play against that cat more times than I fucking cared to, cared to <laughs> you know. But um, I, I'm not surprised that Byron's career play uh, turned into the coaching career that it's become, and I really was rooting for him to be a head coach, uh, especially in Jacksonville. I felt like that would have been full circle. Uh, for him didn't work out, but uh, he's still one of the top coordinators in the NFL. I mean, you know, this guy has put in a ton of work. He's got been under the tutelage of Todd Bowles for a number of years now. And, you know, having somebody like Todd Bowles kind of mentor you into that and groom you into being that kind of coach that can become a head coach is, is invaluable. So um, it's, it's not surprising to me that he's, that he is where he is now. So we were talking about the uh, the trash talk earlier with defensive tackles. Uh, you actually in practice played against two of the best of them, and John Henderson, Marcus oh, Stroud. They God. were a great duo. <laughs> so what were they like? Uh, we uh, Henderson obviously has that famous commercial with the mm-hmm. ESPN commercial. Love and, that commercial, by the way. Yeah. yeah, and Marcus Stroud, very good. Probably the best defensive tackle duo that I've seen in a four three defense. So what were they like on? Yeah. Fields? Oh man, those guys were. I mean, those those dudes were. For me, as a young player, they were larger than life because I had seen them as a college player on TV. Watch, I'd watch them play, you know, because at Purdue, you know, you're in Indiana. So, uh, you know, you see the Colts and, the, you know, you see the AFC South games. And the Colts and the Jags are always a game that would come on and be a, one of them would be a primetime game. So, you know, it would be awesome to watch those. And you would see those guys out there balling and, you know, having to practice against them as a young guy was not easy. <laughs> you know, it was there was a steep learning curve because those guys were were so talented. It was special. Big John is still I still talk to Big John to this day. Uh, Stroud lives here in Atlanta. Uh, see, I see him. I saw him. I saw Stroud a couple years ago um, when we went when we all went back to Jacksonville for their Legends game. Mm. Um, but you know, guys, you know. 
like that guys like that it, especially as a young player they were they without knowing it they were instrumental in me becoming the kind of player I was going to be because I had to play against them every day and I had to like kind of you know you kind of got to catch up right. to in a certain extent practicing against them so you start to be able to uh, anticipate guys moves and 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 just because you're playing against guys that are so big and quick like them mm-hmm. you know other people some players don't seem that hard to block after having a having to play, play against them all the time. So um, they were invaluable to my growth as a player, and they were they were good dudes, man. I mean, we used, they used to have we used to have these little parties every every t- we used to call it Tear It Down Tuesday. Oh, yeah. Tear It Down Tuesday. We have a little cookout on our day off. Have a cookout. We had some we had some uh, what some, is some, some some what is it like feeding you know five big offensive linemen at over three hundred pounds? I mean seriously. <laughs> I mean it's a lot. You got to have a lot of food. Regardless. <laughs> feeding, feeding any 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 pro athletes like that, you got to have a lot of food because <laughs> we got we got we got big appetites. <laughs> I'm sure you do. <laughs> <laughs> we are talking to former ex Jaguar guard Uche Waniri. You know, Uche, you look at the NFL and transition of the game with the new rules and the quarterback play, and now the quarterbacks, you can't even put a pinky on them. You're calling 15-yard penalties, and, and the NFL and, and some of these coaches and some really some now some of the players are complaining about it because uh, last week there were two calls that actually ruined the game and cost two teams a chance of winning a game. So do you like the new rules with the NFL? Do you like that the fact that the NFL protects the quarterbacks like a bunch of babies uh you know look man it's it's like the government you know every, a lot of times you get an overreaction for the sake of of uh over for the sake of overreacting i mean this is this is the nfl trying to you know quell a situation that really if you go through and you look at it the two situation happened two is Tua's concussion situation right. kind of came from the same tackle, you know, that you saw happen to Tom Brady. Like it was the same kind of tackles, the slinging them to the ground tackles. And, you know, that's something that the NFL didn't pay attention to when it was happening to him. So when it happened to him and then you have this storm of ill energy that hits them four days later when Tua's knocked out of a game on Thursday night, no less. <laughs> Uh, because of that, you know, being tackled. I think the NFL sees that and they say, we got to protect our quarterbacks even more because we don't want to, because now you have all these quarterbacks all of a sudden getting knocked out of the games with concussions. So I think they kind of overreacted in that they made it a a bigger point of emphasis with the referees to then, you know, call any aggressive tackles on the quarterback. Now, how does that manifest itself on Sundays? Well, you don't necessarily – you don't see the Jaguars quarterback getting the flag when he gets slammed. No. But you will see that flag come out when you have a Derek Carr getting tackled mm-hmm. or he's actually stripped of the ball while he's being tackled, which you, one could argue he's not even a quarterback anymore at that point. I agree with because you. Because now he's now he's a defender mm-hmm. because the ball was taken out of his hands before he even actually start really was getting tackled. Horrible call, by the um, way. And, and then, of course, you have Atlanta. Brady Jarrett makes a tackle on Tom Brady, mm-hmm. and it's a routine tackle. He actually – you can actually see the the amount of athleticism that he has being that he actually adjusted the path and the velocity of his own tackle, mm-hmm. mid-tackle, to avoid actually really hammering Tom Brady. Mm-hmm. And he went into a barrel roll on his butt and to sling him instead of just – the lift off the ground and sling that you see some defensive players do mm-hmm. to quarterbacks that can cause a ton of damage because you get them off the ground and then you just bury them. <laughs> I mean, it's like rough. And this guy, I mean, I actually commend a lot of defensive players that they are actually able to mentally process and readjust their angles on tackles, mid tackle to try and avoid putting on their weight on the quarterback. Mm-hmm. And they do that partly out of they don't want to get flagged and fine, but also you're not trying to hurt this dude. You're not trying to hurt him. But and you're trying to, you know, be a a, a team sport and not and make it a tackle without making it, you know, a a vicious, you know, kind of violent uh, uh sack, which I mean, come on, man. 